When he became the CIO of Comcast, Rick Riboli was amazed by just how broad his role had become. Moving from product engineering to having a hand in just about every aspect of the business was a big change for Rick, but one he enjoyed. He discusses that journey on this episode of IT Visionaries, and he also goes into how Comcast views the customer experience, the way he is leading innovation at the company, and what the future of tech, connectivity, and IT talent looks like. This podcast is sponsored by the Lightning Platform by Salesforce. Salesforce just introduced the Lightning Platform Mobile, the low-code mobile app development platform that empowers anyone to easily build, publish, and manage AI-powered mobile apps for employees and for customers. Find out more at salesforce.com slash build mobile apps. Welcome to another episode of IT Visionaries. I'm Ian Faison, Chief Content Officer here at Mission.org. And on the other line, Rick, how's it going? It's great. Doing great. We are really excited to have you on the show today. We are going to talk a ton about Comcast. You have been there for a long time, seen a lot of change, been part of a lot of change. And we're going to get into some of your background. But first, how did you get into uh, technology? Yeah, it really started, I think, when I was uh, around 10 years old. And um, I'm going to date myself now. But I first started playing around with an Apple IIe computer and then later the Commodore 64 and uh, found them to be really fun. Was really surprised at all the things I could do as a kid with, with computers, got really excited about using them, started programming them and then uh, got into gaming of course. And uh, the games were a lot, a lot less uh, exciting as they are now, but it was enough to hook me. And um, that's where it all started. I um, went to Penn State, for electrical engineering and graduated out of Penn State and started getting into IT right out of college. You know, it's funny. So we have had, it's got to be over five now at this point. We'd have to go back and check. Producer Hillary, we can go back and check on this. But people who learn to love computers by the Commodore, like it, it is quite, it is a common thing that we hear. And that's so funny. We should do like a special, special report on the, the, the 64. Cause that's, um, it's how a lot of people got excited from the beginning. Um, you, you know, you went to school for electrical engineering, but when did that kind of switch into kind of this IT career that, that you started? Yeah. So when I came out of Penn State and electrical engineering, I, uh, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to really do with electrical engineering and eventually started getting involved more and more with computers. And I joined actually my first two jobs coming out of college were with two large companies in IT. And I learned a lot about computers and networking and found it really exciting and fun. Uh, the only catch was I, I found that IT back then, so back then IT was really a cost center that was typically reporting into the finance organization. And it really wasn't a strategic part of the business. And so after about seven years in IT, I decided it was time to move to a more strategic part. And I was generally in, in um, uh, telecom at the time. And so decided it was time to move into a more strategic part of the business and I started getting more involved in business development and product development and areas like that, but still very, very steeped in technology. How have you seen that change over the years? You know, we talked to a lot of CIOs that really went into it feeling like they were a cost center and now can have had some of the shackles removed. Uh, now it's kind of like the, the leadership team is saying, hey, you need to keep the lights on, but also you need to innovate. What was that like for you? Yeah, it's, so it's really surprising because that was about 20 years ago when I left IT. And, and like I said, it was, it was very much thought of as something you, that a company had to do. It had to, it had to have computers. We had to have cabling and networking. But now it's amazing when you look at all the different companies' strategies, whether it's a digital strategy, e-commerce strategies, so much around data and data intelligence. And so all these same companies that we're looking at as a cost center, I feel now it's a critical part of their business strategy. 
And so that's why it's really exciting to come back to IT now after all these years and, and see this shift of what's happened over the, over 20 years. One of the things that you've talked about in the past is this idea of customer experience. What does customer experience look like at Comcast? So I would say it starts with really understanding what the end to end experience is for the customer. And I think if, if you look at some of the transition that we went through over the years, we went from being, I'd say a classic cable company focused on cable operations. And about 10 years ago, we transitioned to being more of a product and technology company. And we started launching uh, really exciting products like the X1 and the voice remote and X5 and some fantastic products. But it wasn't until over the last three or four years where we started really thinking about the end to end experience and what it means for a customer from the moment they are exposed to Comcast from a sales and marketing perspective, all the way through when they're activated with our products, when a tech comes out to their home, if they have problems and they contact our call centers, that whole experience, the billing experience, so that end to end experience is what we think about when we talk about customer experience. Did you find that as a technologist, like, did you find it surprising how much of other business functions are now layered into this? I mean, we, we talk a lot about how, you know, the roles of CIOs and CMOs have been blending because of technology stacks and thing, things like that. But now it's like the CIO can really, you know, manage the customer end to end like never before. Was that something that was like weird or surprising or something that you were just excited about to be able to, uh, to position and, and, and control that conversation? Yeah, it's, it, it's funny you say that because I've, uh, as you mentioned in the beginning, I've been with the company for a while. So it's been 14 years since I've been with Comcast. And my first 12 years were on the product engineering side. So I was involved with building the technology behind the products that we put in front of our customers. And it's just been the last two years where I um, took on the CIO role. And, and it's amazing the breadth of the CIO role and all the all the pieces it touches within a, in the company. And so really when you look at the functions that we support right now, my team, we literally build and manage the technology that goes all the way from marketing and sales through all the way through to the end customer life cycle and literally touches every aspect of the customer, but also almost every aspect of the company itself. And it wasn't until I actually was in the role for about six months did I realize just the amount of breadth the CIO role has within a company? Gosh, that's got to be music to a lot of our listeners' ears because I think that that's one of those conversations that you know a lot of leaders are having with their with their boards, with their leadership teams right now. Like, how much you know control should the CIO have? How what where where does that role evolve into? You had a, you know, there's a big kind of reorg back in 2017. You know, you were obviously a huge part of that, becoming CIO. What does the IT organization look like now at Comcast? Well, it starts with that, with that reorg that we did. One of the exciting things about the reorg was that the C, and I think it's a unique situation where, where my position reports into our chief customer officer who leads the entire uh, CX team, the entire customer experience team. And so my peers in that organization are the customer care organization, the tech ops organization, and the team that really does CX design. And so by bringing all these teams together, the technology, the operations team, and the CX team, the CX design team together under one roof, it really helped to align all of us on what are the uh, experiences that we're trying to create? And then also, how do, we, how do we execute on them? Because a lot of times it's great to have big ideas, but it's another thing to actually drive consistent execution across a big company like Comcast. So by doing this reorg and getting us all under one umbrella, I think it had a huge impact on the way, on the progress we were able to make on customer experience over the last um, two years. 
I'll also say that the thing that we've been really, as I've been leading the CIO organization, I've really been trying to shift the culture from being, um, I'll say in, in some CIO or some IT organizations, it's easy to fall into being order takers. The CIO organization, you know, takes requests or orders from various parts of the company and kind of executes them in individual silos. And our big focus over the last two years was to start thinking of the IT organization the same way we think about products. And what we, what we did consistently in the product organization, it was very much about building platforms, reusable platforms, and thinking of what we're building in terms of products that are either facing customers or employees. And so that's been a big cultural shift, I think, for my team over the last two years, is trying to get into that, into that same mode that we're in on the product side, where we really leaned forward and thought about building reusable platforms, building products, and, and really being peers with our uh, business owners and product owners, where we're contributing to the strategy and contri- contributing to innovation within the company. Yeah, and how do you how do you look at innovation? Like, are you doing things like hackathons? Or are you doing things like citizen development and all that sort of stuff? Like, how do you drive internally for like your team and then also for the for the company at large? Yeah, I think when it comes to innovation within our company, there's a couple different sources for innovation. I would say one source is, and what we've been doing for the last several years is we have these working sessions where we put the customer first. We put the customer in the center and from a cross-functional organization, we start to think about how we want to change the end-to-end customer experience. And by getting multiple functions in there, the UX team, the product team, the engineering teams, it, it, it's really um, amazing at the ideas that come to the table when you do that. I'd say that's one source are sessions like that where we get everybody's brain thinking about how to create new customer experiences. Another big source is what I would consider to be almost technology bottoms up. So where we step back just from a technology perspective and say, with the technology that we have, what can we do with it? And so I'll I'll give you a, a brief example of this one where it was about seven years ago where we stepped back and said, I had asked my team down in DC, it was just as voice technology was starting to emerge, voice recognition technology. And we asked ourselves, what could we do with this technology? We didn't really have a customer experience in mind, but we really just wanted to understand how we could leverage voice technology along with how we could leverage, we had just built a pretty extensive metadata and content discovery platform. And so the question I'd asked my research team was, what can we do with this? And so they spent about three months coming up with some prototypes. We played around with those and we decided that um, they weren't, it wasn't really a compelling experience. So we pivoted and took another approach. And the short of it was after about six months, we had a pretty interesting prototype for a new way to interact with our video product, which was by talking into an iPhone and controlling the video product. And there was, no, there was no product spec for it. There was no requirements document. We hadn't really even thought about what the end-to-end customer experience would be at that point. It was really technology exploration and seeing what the art of the possible was. And as we continued to iterate it, I ended up having sort of the first one in my house and I played with it and a number of other folks on the team. And at this point, we were still a team of five, six people that were doing sort of a skunk works project. And over the next uh, year and a half or so, we eventually launched it through the iPhone, eventually integrated it into a voice remote. And now we, um, we've launched that full scale. We have almost all of our video customers, all our X1 customers now have voice remotes and they can literally just push a button, talk into the remote and control their X1 experience. And so that's a great example of an innovation that started from technology and, and really emerged from there. And eventually we did bring in product teams and UX teams, but it was after we had already kind of innovated on the initial concept. That's really cool. 
it seems like you're kind of at a at a spot right now where you have a lot of resources that you can potentially start building things like that that kind of change the way that, you know, media is potentially distributed, the way that customers can engage with media uh, in a way that, you know, some of the, I, you could say startups, they're not so startup y now, but, you know, some of the companies, like other companies that have had a, that have been innovating in, in technology. Do you feel like your team is working on stuff that, like, kind of is going to deliver the future of media? I do. I, I, I feel like there's a number of places within the company where we're doing some really innovative work. I mean, I'm sure others are working on in, in similar areas, but I think our focus, a lot what happened with the voice remote was it was our level of expertise in a particular area and then just the focus of continuing to execute on it and iterate on it, I, I think allowed us to create a best in class capability. And I think there's more of those in the works right now in a couple other different spots, both within the product organization and within our um, IT organization that I lead. With internet being like the, the lifeblood, the currency now for everyone, specifically with business, um, specifically with, you know, how we're connected all the time. Do you kind of feel like the 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 level has been raised for what Comcast is expected from its customers? You know, when when your business internet goes down, it quite literally shuts down, you know, productivity. When your, uh, you know, personal internet goes out and you have a paper due the next day or something, you know, you're in you're in a really bad spot. People expect you know kind of you only go to the doctor when you're sick. The only reason you might hop on a hop on a call with Comcast is because your internet's out. Do you kind of feel like the stakes have been raised in that perspective over the past ten years? Oh, a- absolutely. When it, it, it's it's funny because we often joke that sometimes people the internet connectivity is more important to some people than electricity or running water in their homes. It's become sort of the, the, um, the, the, the most important capability within a home. And, and we've really, over the last several years, we've really started to up our game on internet, both on the reliability side and on the, I'll say the product side. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some, some concrete examples on both. On the product side, we launched something called XFi. And the whole idea with XFi is it gives you more control over your internet experience in the home. And so I always joke because my, um, we have several kids and uh, they're, they're a little bit older now, but when they were younger, my wife would constantly be threatening to shut off their internet. And she used to always, I would come home with all the gadgets from Comcast Labs and she would always say, but I'm, I'm really looking for, where's the God app? I need the God app. And the God app was total control over internet because it was the most important thing going on in our home. And one day I came home with the XFi app prototype and I gave it to her and I handed it to her and she's like, what's this? And I said, just hit this button. And she pressed the button and literally both our boys just started screaming from different corners of the house. And she got a big smile on her face and it was a scary moment for me because I realized that I pro- provided her with possibly too much power than she could handle. <laughs> <laughs> and, and um, but it was a fantastic example of, from there on, she created profiles for the kids. We put in all their devices. She could turn on and off different devices in the home. She could have them set to a schedule. So if she wanted to make sure they were off the devices by 9 p.m. every night, it would automatically do that. And so it's a great example of, from a control, convenience and control perspective, it's the capabilities that we're putting on top of just the raw internet service that I think is really valuable to some consumers. And then on the, on the reliability side, we've been putting a lot of energy into really building proactive monitoring and proactive capabilities. And so one example, is specifically in my organization, is a project that we implemented called um, AIQ. And the whole idea with this platform is that it combines the knowledge of what's going on with our customers. So it it pulls in customer context, as we like to say, which means it understands what's going on within the home in terms of 
errors coming from modems or set top boxes. It understands what recent transactions might have occurred within that house. And then it also understands natural language processing. It was technology we pulled over from our voice remote. And so if, if someone uh, contacts us through our chat bot, for instance, it understands the intent of what they're asking about. So it combines the intent of customers along with the knowledge of what's going on in the home and then starts to recommend actions to customers and both to customers and to our internal employees. So it's a great way to first proactively try to address a lot of the problems that might start showing up in homes. And then if we don't get it proactively, then through chatbots and communication with employees, we can then at least react quickly, reactively uh, address customers' problems in these areas. You know, it's so f- funny. I-, I didn't know about the X5 before before we got on, and I was looking at it, and the school nights, you know, set your sleep and wake times. Uh, for other folks, if you don't have kids, that's called the, uh, you know, happy marriage, uh, turn off the internet at a certain time of night so that everybody, you know, actually talks to each other or whatever it is, uh, not browsing on their phones. I think those types of things, I, we, it just feels like we're in the infancy of being able to unplug in that way. And it, we just haven't, like you said, you know, or like your wife said, haven't had the God button uh, that you can kind of control those things. And I think, you know, for a lot of families, having that control, having security, being able to protect, you know, from a lot of the stuff that's out there on the internet is is hugely important. But the other piece of that is just being connected. And I think, you know, the slowest our internet is ever going to be is right now. You know, every day it's going to get faster and faster, hopefully. And that's what I think is really exciting. That's tough to see in the moment, but in the future, 10 years from now, something that, you know, as a consumer of this, as, you know, I'm a Xfinity customer, the Xfinity hotspots was something that was really a game changer for me that I could use on the go and, and, and dial into these hotspots. That was something that, you know, I don't remember a product rollout. I don't remember that in marketing. I don't remember that. I just remember, or I just saw one day that there was these Xfinity hotspots. Can you talk about like, what does this look like in 10 years? You know, I know you don't, you, you can't, you know, read the tea leaves, but, but what does this look like in terms of like speed and accessibility? If you're a customer, you know, potentially nationwide, potentially in other markets uh, or other countries or things like that. Sure. I think, uh, yeah, like you said, it's, it's, it's tricky to try to predict things too far out into the future, but I think at least in the next three to five year time period, I think folks will stop thinking about when they buy internet service from someone like Comcast, they'll stop thinking about uh, in-home internet service versus mobile versus Wi-Fi hotspots. It's going to feel just like a seamless uh, internet connectivity product you're buying from us. So the in-home will obviously continue to be much faster. We're working on actually a, a, a 10 gig initiative right now to be able to deliver 10 gig to the home. So, so speeds will always continue to increase faster, I think, in the homes. But I think when you look at between the in-home services that we'll be providing, the hotspots that'll continue to get broader and broader. And then we also offer Xfinity Mobile, which is a mobile product where you can get unlimited data. You can buy it by the gig or you can buy unlimited data. And so the three of those combined really just create a seamless data experience. And I think over time, folks will just think of it as I get internet from a provider like Comcast, not thinking about it in these separate disjoint purchases or services that they buy. Well, yeah. I mean, and I think that someone, uh, I forget who it was. I think it was, um, actually, I, I don't remember offhand, but uh, they said there's only there's only two things that happen in business, bundling and unbundling. Um, it's like startups come you know, into the market with something that is uh, a differentiated product, and then that becomes a bundle, and then it becomes unbundled again. I mean, I think the idea of like the fact that our internet comes from our connectivity comes from different places and different providers and everything feels really weird. 
you know, the fact that you're switching back and forth to these different things that, you know, your business internet and your home internet and then whoever your cell phone provider or whatever it is, it feels disconnected because it is. Do you think that the way that we, what we expect from, you know, Comcast, for example, going forward. So we expect super fast internet wherever it is that we go. But then what are the what are the other things that we'll be able to expect? What are the future features or things like that, like you created with the voice remote, like you created with XFi? Yeah, I think what, what you'll see more of on, well, specifically on the internet side is we're going to continue to add features on top that make it simple and secure and give folks control. So I think you'll see more capabilities around security. You'll see more capabilities that allow within your home, for instance, we, we added pods, these uh, physical devices that you can plug in around your home to make sure that you've got contiguous coverage throughout the home. And so I think for starters, what you'll see on the internet side is more and more capabilities that allow customers to ensure you've got great connectivity within the home that allow you to control that access really well and put a security layer on there so that you know as you're using that service that it's a, it's a highly secure service. Um, I also think over time, we're gonna be doing more and more with Internet of Things and connecting other devices within the home. I would also expect more and more within the homes, voice accessibility will become more prevalent, not just for what you can do today with controlling your TV and controlling, like today you can use it to also control your, your security services, right? Cameras in the home and, uh, and other security products that we offer. But it'll also allow greater control and more flexible control on other devices through IoT. I think those are sort of natural evolutionary paths for our products. And then I think more and more as we were mentioning earlier about customer experience, we're, we're really looking at how do we create this seamless experience for customers an easy, simple experience for customers as they just interact with us in general. So, you know, in years past, the, the way customers interacted with us was typically picked up a phone and called us to buy something to service something or, to, or we had to send a tech out to come try to repair things. And more and more, I think what you'll see as customers interact with us, it's going to be much more digitally oriented, much simpler. And, and when I say digital, in, in multiple channels, right? So it can be today, customers can interact with us through chat bots that we've developed internally. It can be through our website where we've built things like my account, which allows you to manage a lot of the aspects of your business through my account. We're doing a lot more through, through SMS texting, right? So, so today, for instance, if you were in the middle of, a, you're, you're about to have a tech come out to your home, we've developed a capability called real-time assist where you'll automatically get a text telling you that the tech is going to be on site within X amount of time. You can go onto my account and you can actually see where that tech is in their arrival, you can find out information about the tech. If you, if you decided you wanted to change your appointment or you wanted a different time slot, we created a capability now where you can use SMS to interact with us to say, I want to sign up for a, a different time slot. And if that time slot shows up, we'll text you back and say, you got it. And, and so I think as you look at all these different interaction patterns where we're really trying to change the customer experience in a big way is just to make it so much simpler and easier for them, for customers to interact with us. And we know that customers prefer to interact with us through digital communication channels versus picking up the phone and calling us or having to have a tech come out to um, fix their problems. And so we're trying to really go where the customers want to be, whether it's an app, whether it's a website, whether it's texting. And so I think that's a, a Alongside with the product advancements, I think that's an area where there's going to be uh, continued progress over the next couple of years in that space. What about things like machine learning, um, leveraging AI to be predictive on things like outages or, 
you know, potentially like letting people know ahead of time. I mean, you know, I think the the internet is out sort of a <laughs> sort of a thing happens a lot of times for many different reasons. But at the end of the day, the customer, I think a lot of times will just blame whoever they their internet provider is. Are there things, you know, like AI or or ML that you're looking at that could potentially, you know, lean forward in the foxhole a little bit? Yes, so absolutely. And and we have we have a lot of experience with with AI and ML. The the uh, the voice remote and the X1 platform that I referenced before are built heavily on um, machine learning and deep learning technologies that we we were working on uh, as long as seven, seven, eight years ago. And so as a company, we've invested a lot of time and money in, in leveraging machine learning and deep learning technologies, but it's been more on the product side. And what we've done now over the last two years is really start to experiment with how can we take that technology that we already have a lot of experience in and leverage it to solve business problems. And so one of the biggest areas we're using right now, we're using it for right now is in this platform I mentioned earlier called AIQ. And so the idea here is that we've typically had a fair amount of data um, within the organization um, about, you know, different aspects of what's going on in the home, whether it's a, whether it's a cable modem or a set top box or it's equipment in our network, but it hasn't all been brought together in a, in a way that would allow us to join it all together and then make predictions and recommendations on what we could do to resolve problems. And that's essentially what this IQ platform does. It takes the data across the enterprise and, and captures all of that and then combines it with natural language processing and then uses that to really, and machine learning, to essentially predict when we think problems are happening in the home. And then when we see that we think there's actions that we could take to remedy the situation, we then make that information available across all the channels. So not just the chat bot, but also through the IVR, through our um, service agents, as well as our website and apps. And so that's really a huge initiative for us. It really kicked off about a year ago. And I'd say we're, you know, we're about halfway into the adventure at this point or the journey at this point. I think there's a lot of capabilities ahead of us. I want to switch gears toward some of the way that you think about talent. What do you look for for people on your team? Um, how do you go about finding new people for your team? Uh, where are the places that you're looking? And, and just kind of your overall leadership philosophy on, on, on building a team of uh, IT professionals and technologists. Yeah, I think w when I think about talent, there's really two big categories. There's um, obviously the technical knowledge. And so we're really looking for folks that have experience in software development and cloud technologies. We do a lot now with AWS in the cloud. We also do a lot with Cloud Foundry in our private cloud. And so definitely looking for people with deep technical experiences but very much looking for, when, when I interview, I very much, I usually review people's resumes for their technical abilities, interview a little bit on the technical abilities, spend a lot of time on the culture when I'm interviewing. And I think we here have at Comcast have a very unique culture. And it's one of the reasons I've stayed for 14 years in that our culture is, is very collaborative. And I think we've developed, I would say over the last 10 years or so, a really strong culture around the technical talent where teams get together and share concepts, share ideas, agree on execution. And one of the things that we changed a bunch of years ago was we integrated our product development teams and our engineering technology teams together in one, one organization. And it was around the same time that we transitioned into being an agile organization. And so when we did that, we were able to create smaller teams that were more autonomous. And I think with more autonomous teams, they're able to do a lot more in terms of move quickly, collaborate, you know, collaborate more, iterate, deploy, 
learn from customer experiences, iterate, deploy. And so I think over time, we've, we've built a fantastic culture here. And that's one of the things that I, I look for the most. And sometimes I'll find very smart individuals, very highly technical folks. But if I don't think they're going to fit into the culture here, I'll take a pass on them. And as I've been, in, in terms of where I've been looking for talent, you know, traditionally, we've hired in at more senior levels of talent, I'd say, over the last bunch of years. And, and recently, we've been really developing what we call junior, a junior pipeline. And so we've been spending a lot of energy with universities in working with both internships and folks recently graduating. So for instance, two weeks ago, there was an event here in Philly, uh, Philly Code Fest, and we sponsored Drexel. We were, we were a gold sponsor for Drexel in their event, and it was Drexel, it was Penn State University, uh, it was a number of local universities. And so we were the key sponsor, and I did a keynote in the beginning and kicked it off, and then we closed it with, with judging at the end and award ceremony and all that. And then the winners got to come back here to Comcast Center. We, we, built, we recently built a new tower here in Philadelphia, Comcast Technology Center, which is about 40 floors of space in a brand new tower. And um, it was about 40 floors and about 4,000 engineers and product folks. And so, we, so the winners of that got a tour of our building and uh, spent some time with us for, during the day, had lunch with us. And it's a great example of how we're trying to develop this junior pipeline. We're trying to get our name out there as a technology and product company because I think a lot of the universities probably think of us more as a cable company than a technology and product company. And when they come into the building and take a tour and see our products, they're literally amazed. You know, when they leave the building, they think of us in a totally different light than when they came into the building. And so that's been a really big focus for us in terms of recruiting over the last six months to a year. And for listeners who want to check that out, you can just go to phillycodefest.com. That's really cool. I mean, I think that things like that are just so critical for technology leaders to kind of own the backyard that they that they that they live in and to be able to build those pipelines, those like micro pipelines of talent because you know, it's really, you know, we talk a lot about how marketing needs to be remarkable. It needs to be memorable. It needs to be something that matters. Well, what what better way to stand out in, in a young person's mind than, you know, that tour that they went to? I mean, they'll probably remember that for the rest of their career. Uh, it doesn't happen all the time. And especially when you have a university and the Drexel College of Computing and Informatics, like that's a place where like, you know, talent, talent resides and that's an important place, you know, when it's in your backyard. Yeah. I, I, I think it was a, it was a great experience for us and a great experience for them. Cause every time I love, I love these events, these hackathons, we, we do something internally three times a year called lab week, which is basically a week long hackathon. And so I attended their hackathon for the weekend. It was a weekend hackathon at Drexel and met a lot of really interesting students with a lot of great ideas. And I had the same energy coming out of that as I do when we, when we do our lab week. It, within Comcast, we have a lab week that goes, starts on Monday morning, and folks can work on whatever they want. They pick projects, and developers and products folks get to work on whatever they want for the week. And the only rule is that at the end of the week, they have to go present what they built at a lab fair. And then in the lab fair, we all walk around and uh, everyone in the company can walk around. So very often our CEOs there, our presidents there, and lots of the engineers and we, everyone walks around and gets pitches of everybody's lab week projects. And it is, the most, it is the most fun. All kinds of new ideas coming out. Many of them we've turned around and productized and actually put into you know, customer facing products or, or our backend systems. And so it's just a level of energy that gets created in those types of events. And we, we do it three times a year. And Drexel's event was, uh, they do it once a year for, for a weekend. We got a lot out of that, that small investment in the event. All right, let's get into the lightning round. These questions are going to be fast and easy, just like the lightning platform by Salesforce. 
You can go to salesforce.com slash build mobile apps to learn more about the Lightning platform. These questions, fast and easy. Are you ready? I'm ready. What app are you using on your phone that is the most fun? I don't know if I've got any really good fun apps on my phone right now. They're all like, they're all very work oriented, very like, very productivity oriented. Well, all right. That's number, that's yeah, the second I think, question. I think I'm going to take a pass on what could be your, your easiest your easiest question. What's your favorite productivity tool? Um, I would say right now it is Microsoft Teams, believe it or not. Um, so we just launched Microsoft Teams in the organization and I'm finding it to be pretty interesting in the way it's helping me to integrate all the different things I'm doing within the office. Favorite vacation spot? Kauai. Ka- Kauai. I just got I just got back from Kauai and uh, that's a pretty common not common answer but uh, yeah, I hear a pretty decent amount. It's a great place. I love it. My it's my favorite place on earth. It's it's got all the feeling of uh, island vacation, but I get to drive on the right side of the road. U.S. currency. There's you know very few bugs. It's it's got like all the criteria. Lots of golf courses, beaches. It it clicks all the buttons for me. Do you have a favorite book or podcast that you've read or listened to recently? Uh, favorite book recently was um, Principles. I thought the book was really interesting in the way the author explains his thinking about the way he's done investments over the years, but then also the way he's just sort of applied it to his personal life and business. And um, I thought it was, it was really thoughtful and I, I, I read lots of business books and often, you know, highlight a bunch of different areas, but that was one where I just found myself continuing to highlight area after area. So I thought that was a, that was a fantastic book. What do you do for fun? For fun? I, um, I would say for the most part, I'd say golf is probably the most fun. I used to coach my son's baseball teams, which were a lot of fun, but eventually became work as they got older. So I, I think that sort of, that sort of petered out and uh, golf is probably what I do for the most fun. What technology are you most excited about going forward? Um, I think two areas I'm most excited about. One is AI, machine learning, as we talked about earlier. I just think on the business, and if, if you're able, I think the trick with machine learning and AI is whether you can, whether it's all about the data, right? And so assuming businesses can compile the data the right way. I think machine learning has humongous potential to change the way a lot of businesses really operate today. And then the second area is cloud, but possibly for different reasons and other folks are excited about cloud. I'm really focused on how do we create better experiences for our developers, right? So we talked about customer experience, We talked about employee experience. I think there's a really big opportunity with focusing on developer experience or DevX. And I think there's a lot of friction. If you look at the way we all build software today, there's a lot of friction built into that that process. And I think cloud is one of the, one, one big area that can really take a lot of the friction out. And by allowing folks to use whether it's public clouds or private clouds and developers uh, and the tools that kind of come along with that and developers don't need to do as much work as they do now in terms of getting environments stood up, testing code, deploying code, all the pieces that really make development this elongated process. I think there's a, um, a really big opportunity to, cre- to create great developer experiences. And as we were talking about earlier, it's, as it's harder and harder to attract talent, develop talent, I think the more we can do that, the better off we'll be. What question do you never get asked that I didn't ask you today that you wish you were asked more often? These are, this isn't like the fast and furious. Right? <laughs> These are the, the, the <laughs> it's more just so I don't talk. That's really the key. <laughs> uh, I don't have anything for you on that one. It's all good. All right. 
best advice for a first time CIO? Um, I would say best, best advice is, is first really understand the scope of the role and the impact that you have across the organization. I think that's probably the first step. And one of the things that I needed to do when I first stepped into the role. And then the other one is I would say, I think CIO roles traditionally, uh, the CIO role has sort of a traditional stigma attached to it. And, and, and I would say, don't let yourself be defined by the role, but take the time to try to, you know, you take the time to try to define the role. Because I think in many cases, the CIO role is thought of as this sort of, can be thought of as this tactical IT role. And I think for folks that really step back and really look at what they can do in, in these roles, it's pretty, pretty huge and pretty impactful. But you really do have to sort of step back and almost forget about the title and really look at what you can do with the role. I love it. Rick, this has been absolutely awesome having you on the show. Um, those are great last words. Anything else? Anything to plug? Anything uh, our listeners should check out? No, I, I think we, we talked about a lot of our products. I think, um, I think I'm good. I really appreciate you having me on the show. It's been great talking with you. This has been great. Thanks so much. Appreciate your time. All right. Thank you. Salesforce just introduced Salesforce Blockchain, the industry's first truly declarative blockchain platform integrated into your CRM. Learn more at salesforce.com slash blockchain.